Hello everybody and welcome to this support talk session. My name is Hilda Ortega and I am a community manager of the Cisco community and the host of today's event. So before we get started, I would like to tell you that today's topic is really interesting because actually we are going to answer that question that if I really need an RMA or not, and that is about like how to determine a legitimate hardware issue. And also, I want to mention to you that the Cisco community is an online forum with over half million, actually, we are getting close to the million members, where you can get answers to your technical questions prior to opening cases with attack. Also, you can check documents, videos, and blogs that can help you out to learn more or solve your questions. And you can also help others by answering questions or reading all the content that you can see there. So before we get started, I just would like to go over with you with a couple of information, some upcoming events and activities that might be useful for you. So firstly, we had the Ask Me Anything following this event. So this is gonna be open till May 21st. And here, Ambrose and Nathan will be helping out to cover all the questions related to these RMA topics and all the troubleshooting things and alternatives that you can run into. And how does it work? It is open just starting now, and you will see all the information in the chat panel to access to this forum, this forum event. And here, let's say that just a couple of hours after this event, uh, you think about one question or you encounter a problem. I don't wish you to have that, but just in that case, you just go to this forum event and you clarify your question. Remember, you have a couple of days to do it, so I highly encourage you to do that. And as well, if we did not get the chance to actually answer to your question during the live session, please uh, have a look to this forum event because there we will be allocating the question and solving it. Also, I would like to invite you to have a look to all the support talks events that we have hosted in the Cisco community. Here you can see a different range of different tech tools that can help you out to solve your issues and save time. You can have a look to the collaboration solutions analyzer, the tech bot, the CLI analyzer, my devices, or the different wireless tech tools that you have. Also, we would like to invite you to become an event top contributor, and that is by collaborating with the community. And if you'd like to host an event one day or just a session, just contact us and we'll be able to make you a top contributor and event top contributor. And as well, please help us out to rate different content that you see on the Cisco community. That help us out to recognize the quality of things that are located in the community. That is, if you see, for instance, a document that really help you out to learn more or solve an issue, please give it a helpful vote. It's really easy. You just only have to click on that tiny start and that will help out as well. Also, if you are asking some questions in the community and someone gave you a solution, please help us out to market as an accepted solution. And that will help us out in future and to other people to identify very quickly all the answer to some questions that they might have. And remember that we always take that into consideration and give monthly prices for the top contributors. For instance, if you find this session very helpful, just give it a helpful vote, either to the slides, to the video, or to the event page. And well, just to get started with this event, I would like to introduce you to, to our panel today. So first of all, we add Amber Taylor, which is a technical leader with the customer delivery team at Cisco. He has over one decade of experience in the IT industry, and he has been working at Cisco for eight years, starting in the Catalyst switching team. And then he has been a technical leader for the Catalyst products for two years. He holds the CCI Enterprise infrastructure. So hi, Ambrose, and thank you so much for joining today. So on the other hand, we have Nathan Pan. Uh, he is a technical consulting engineer with the Enterprise Routing Switch Team at Cisco. He has over half a decade of experience in the IT industry, and he has been working with Cisco for five years. He started in the calorie switching team as well, and he has a, been a tech lead in the enterprise switching team for three years. This year, Nathan will transition to the technical leader for the Catalyst products. Hi, Nathan, and welcome to this event. 
also we have Ryan joining us today and he will be helping us out to cover all the different questions in the meantime that Ambrose and Nathan are presenting during this event. So thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. All right, so for of you who would like to have a deeper look to everything that the presenters are showing up today and sharing with us, you can check it out, all the slides and the information in the Cisco community. They are available already, so have a look there. Uh, the link will be appearing on the chat. And remember, if you find it useful, don't forget to give a helpful vote. Please uh, use the Q&A panel to submit your questions. Uh, that will help us out to manage them properly. The Q&A panel, you'll be able to find it on the right side of your screen if you're on a desktop or laptop, or just in the tiny spheres if you're on a mobile device. Uh, please use the, the chat panel just in the case that you have a logistic issue, like for instance, I have no audio, I would like to contact one expert, or I would like to do something in particular. So, well, that's everything from my side. So I wish all of you learn a lot from this. It's a very useful session and I will pass on the ball and the microphone to Neil. All right, thank you. So in today's session, we're gonna cover the topic, do I need an RMA? How can we determine that we have a legitimate hardware issue or we have something else going on? Today's agenda will cover the following topics. What is hardware failure? What is hardware non-failure? We'll provide examples of both hardware and non-hardware failure scenarios. We'll provide a troubleshooting checklist, and then at the end, we'll have a live Q&A for further questions. So there's quite a bit of content today. Uh, we'll go relatively fast. Uh, we're gonna try to get this all within an hour with about 15 minutes available for questions. First, we'll just kick it off with a basic polling question, just to kind of get a sense of how familiar the audience is with hardware troubleshooting tools. So do you rely on Cisco hardware diagnostics tools, such as goal diagnostics, post diagnostics, any other type of diagnostics like that to help identify your hardware issues? And should, you should be able to see the responses right now. Okay, great, I do see them. Yeah, so it looks like it's a fairly uh, distributed split here. Um, you know, some people say they're you know, not sure, about to go to a quarter of people saying yes, quarter of people saying no. Um, others saying uh, not sure or no response, right? So great, uh, it looks like this is gonna be a good opportunity to kind of describe some of the tools you have in your toolkit in order to identify whether or not you have a hardware problem. So first off, let's just start with the basic question. What is hardware failure? The way we define hardware failure is a failure that is happening at layer one. It's a physical component type failure. Hardware failure can be described as a device or a component that cannot be fixed or recovered by any other means. It cannot be fixed by reload, etc. cetera. Uh, genuine hardware failure within Cisco Catalyst devices is very, very rare. Out of our total install base, we see a very, very small number that are actually you know, failures that are actually attributed to legitimate hardware issue. So what are some of the signs of legitimate hardware failure? We've created a quick list of the primary symptoms that it can be attributed to hardware failure. Number one is that it cannot be recovered by a software upgrade or reboot. Uh, you would see potentially a post-diagnostic uh, LED status light or diagnostic failure. The failure cannot be fixed by moving the device to another slot or chassis, the component always fails no matter where you, you take it. Uh, it. It's always broken the same way. And it's always broken in the same component, meaning if it's broken on PoE, it stays broken on PoE. The symptoms never change. Uh, if you apply console to the, to the device, you may not see any messages. It'll just be a blank screen. Or the more obvious one is, you know, there's smoke or fire or some kind of visible damage indicating that hardware is in fact broken. So next, we're gonna cover these following layer one hardware issues. We'll cover boot up, LED status indicators, post gold diagnostics, ports, stack ports, and PoE. So starting off with boot up. This slide shows basically our start to finish boot process. When you first apply power, we go through power init stage, we light the status LED, and then we prompt hardware initiation on our console. 
we run our POST, which is a power-on self-test. This is test basic low-level hardware to make sure that the device is able to boot at a fundamental level. At that point, Bootstrap is loaded. Bootstrap is uh, the component that starts reading information on how it's going to boot up. Where is my iOS? Load that into RAM, et cetera. Now, if you were to have some kind of exception at Bootstrap, you might land in this Raman stage. Uh, this could be some kind of configuration problem, software corruption, et cetera. But assuming that nothing goes wrong, Bootstrap will skip straight to loading iOS. That is loaded into our system RAM. And then we start loading your configuration, find your startup config, and so on. And assuming that nothing is wrong with a setting or something there, we, we load it up and, and your device is booted. So let's get into some examples of boot up here. On this slide, we have a couple consoles that were taken from a lab device. And we're showing, you know, on console A, we basically have this repetitive message, initializing hardware, initializing hardware, and then we go into this boot fail message. On console B, you can see that we get a little bit further. There's obviously a lot more information on this screen. Um, so the question would be, one of these is legitimate hardware failure, and one is not. So which one is which? Well, in this case, console A is hardware failure. We never get past the hardware in it phase. We just repeatedly show that same message, but we're not able to reach you know, any other phase in that, that stepped list. Here, we can see that we're actually just booting an unsupported code. And we'll go a little bit further into this here. So let's take even a deeper dive into console A. Here we see we report power in it. Here we see that bootstrap is not seen. So we get stuck at the post-diagnostic level and never actually load bootstrap and never the device will never boot. Now on console B, things look a little bit different. In this case, we make it all the way to load iOS. We load our bootstrap, we find the image, we start loading iOS and we can't. Right? Reason being is that we have an unsupported code on this particular platform, and so when it goes to load it, it says this is not compatible with this hardware, and so we generate a crash file instead. So in this case, while they're both crashing and neither can boot, only console A was a legitimate hardware failure. Console B, that device could have been fixed by loading the appropriate software. So now let's move on to LED status indicators which is our second section we're gonna cover. In this section, we'll note some LED statuses. Um, we're gonna cover three different types, a fan tray, power supply, and then a module from a CAT 9400. There are a lot of different status messages or colors that you could see, uh, but the, the ones that we're gonna cover here are gonna be more related to an actual hardware problem. So you can see that we have this status indicator. The two important colors to pay attention to here would be amber or red. One of them indicates that there's a single fan that's not running, and the other indicates that two or more fans are not running. Here we have a table for power supply LEDs. Again, we have a variety of different LED messages that you can see, but red is the most important one in this case. Red is telling us that there is a fault on that power supply. Our output voltage is not within range, um, or potentially we have a fan failure, there's no fan rotation, or there's something, you know, input power is applied, but then the power supply module is disabled. This indicates that there is a problem with this particular power supply and we need to take action on it. For modules, we both have a status indicator of the module itself. Basically, if you're in red, it says that a test other than a basic port test, or these ports lively, has failed. So some more significant diagnostic test has failed. The other useful thing you can get from a module status uh, light indicators are problems potentially with either a faulty port link, which is blinking amber, or an alternating green and amber can help you identify whether or not there are error packets being detected on that link. So you're receiving a, a bad CRC, you have input error, some other type of error type packet arriving indicating not so much that necessarily the module has an issue, but there is something in the path between it and its connection that, that is problematic. So moving on to diagnostics. In this section, we'll cover both post and goal diagnostics, what they test, how to see the results, 
and how to run a test manually. First, we'll cover post. You can see the results of post in show post. And in this case, when we check show post, we see that there is a failure. A fan test has failed. Now, why is that? Well, on the device which we were using, uh, there was just a missing fan, right? In this case, it says fan test had failed, meaning there was nothing to test in that case. It tried to run it, there was no fan there, and so it reported a failed result. Uh, it could just report it if that fan had also failed but was physically there. Moving on to gold diagnostics. So post diagnostics are run very early on, right at boot up, as we've seen before. Uh, gold diagnostics start running a little bit later in the boot up process, and they do a similar thing, although a little bit more exhaustively. So in this slide here, we can show you know, the basic default tests for three different types of catalyst 9Ks, 93, 94, and 95. Uh, so some tests will run automatically upon boot up. This is dependent on the diagnostic level you have set, diagnostic boot up minimal, complete, how many of these tests run automatically. Um, you'll see if something wasn't tested, it just didn't run automatically, it'll come back with a U. Uh, if you see a dot, that means that that test ran and passed, and an F flag means failed. To get a little bit better understanding of what these gold diagnostics do, the CLI does have a description of what they, what they are. This can be very helpful if you want to run a manual test to determine if a component is healthy. Uh, so within this, you can get a description of what is the test going to do, is it going to be relevant to the, the issue that you're troubleshooting, and most importantly, is this test disruptive? Some tests can be run anytime. They're not disruptive. They won't impact your traffic or your production. Other tests, like noted at the bottom, is disruptive. If you run a Dyke stack cable test, you could potentially interrupt operations, right? It, it, what it has to do to be able to run that test is disruptive and could impact traffic or cause a device to reload or something of that nature. So lastly, from just an understanding of how to read what is going on from a gold diagnostics perspective, you can look at this output. This tells you it's got a whole key at the top of whether a test is disruptive, non-disruptive, whether it's run on minimal boot, complete boot, as I mentioned before. And also, if you have user configurations, like a time interval, if you've manually configured something to run every you know, 10 seconds, you'll see that configured interval. You'll also be able to see if the, the monitoring is active or inactive. So here's just a little bit further breakout of that key. And here we'll give an example of that same problem, right? We had a fan failure, which we saw in post. Gold also checks that. So we can look at a show diagnostic description. We can see, hey, this is our fan test. Our attribute shows it's active. We can look at the diagnostic result of that test, and we see that the F flag is set for fail. And that's for the same reason that we saw it fail at post. Here's some examples of what you would see from a syslog. So when we run a test, you should see a message emanated whether into the syslog as to whether or not that test has passed or failed. So, you know, example one, we see pass, it, it has failed. In example two, we see that that test completed successfully. Either way, you should be able to retrieve these results from the syslog as well. And then finally, we show what it's like to run a, diagnos a diagnostic test that is disruptive. The ECLI will try to warn you that this may cause a problem, right, and that you should consider, you know, taking a maintenance window or whatever you need to do to safely run this test. And here we can see test is disruptive. In this case, this test does flat ports to cause some traffic impact. So moving on to the next section, we'll cover ports and stack ports. Three main things we're gonna cover here is link up, errors and CRCs on an interface, and then stack cable issues. So first will be link up. We'll start with SFPs and fiber type connections. Here you can see a picture, and this is something I put together in my lab. It's a, it's a test optic to measure local link-up ability. So I took a known good SFP, I split a fiber cable, and you can see that there's a white and a yellow pair. And I connected the white transmit to the white receive of that SFP. Now, if you plug this in to a port on a module and it comes up, 
it clears that local port as having a problem with an ability to link up, right? That socket's okay on the, the module. It can physically link up. If it does not come up with a self-loop cable, then that local port probably is the source of the issue. Um, this is a very straightforward test. It's very hard to, to fail this. It either can or cannot come up. If it does come up, then the local port is not the problem, and we need to test the other end. Um, this is very useful in circumstances where you may not have access to the remote end. You have an ISP circuit, which they provided you the other end, and so you need to do some basic low-level troubleshooting on your side so that you understand what it is that you're asking when you're reaching out to them to engage and get them to look at their site. So what are some of the tools we have from the CLI to help identify SFP link-up issues? SFP light levels are the main thing that drive whether or not a link can come up up. Right? So some of our SFPs have a feature called DOM, or Digital Optical Monitoring. And any SFP that we have in our, our optic matrix will show whether or not it is DOM capable in the PID of that SFP. Uh, it can identify if a port is receiving and transmitting enough light. Uh, you can also see that there are syslogs generated um, when we start violating the lower thresholds or upper thresholds. In our case, we're saying that we are getting low power on our interface, meaning when we look at the command below from DOM, which is our show interfaces transceiver detail, we're given some thresholds of how this optic should work. In this case, our very lowest alarm threshold is at minus 13.9. We are in a range where we are at an alarm level. We are at 14.9, meaning this link is receiving such low light that it's, it's considered very weak, right? Our port could start flapping. We could start seeing errors. The link itself could become unstable or maybe even not able to reach an up state if this gets too low. So what do we do if we don't have an SFP and we're dealing with copper? We have another type of signaling test that's called TDR. A TDR allows you to check copper. And in Catalyst 9K devices, it tests for three basic things, right? There's two types of faults. That's either an open or a short fault, or it's normal. Uh, it detects that cable fault by basically signaling through the cable and then getting a read back. Uh, depending on how that read, the, the reflected signal comes back, tells us the status of that cable. Now, there's a lot of caveats of TDR. We provided a link for the documentation on this. Just because it's, it's implemented differently on different platforms, you do need to consult that appropriate platform hardware guide to understand how that test is run, uh, what types of faults it's going to check for, et cetera. In our case, we're working off of a 9300, so we're going to give an example based on the functionality of TDR for that device. So to run a TDR cable test on a 9300, uh, you run the test cable diagnostics, TDR, and then your interface. Now you need to wait about 10, 15 seconds, at least till the test is complete, so that you're not getting a false positive or incorrect result. To view the results, we use the bottom command, show cable diagnostics. And here we can see that we have a one gig interface and that our pairs, you can see how they're connected and you can see our pair status, right? In our case, it says normal. If there was a problem detected via TDR, it would say either open or short, and we would know that there was a physical problem with that cable. So cable is good, no open or short here. So what about input errors? The link is up, it's fine, but we're seeing CRC and input errors, right? So in a basic show interface command, um, you can see these incre errors incrementing, right? These are usually receive errors, meaning that if you are running this command and seeing CRCs increment, increment on our 10 gig 101, it's most likely that it is arriving to that interface coming from the remote side. Uh, typically, CRCs are a result of poor SFP seating, maybe a bad port, uh, bad SFP, bad cable, or some kind of infrastructure in between the patch panel or something of that nature. And so how do we troubleshoot that? Uh, the first thing we really need to do is run a few iterations of this command. Are these errors actively incrementing or are they historic? Um, we can also clear our counters just to get a clean baseline. Again, we need to run a couple iterations. Yes, in fact, they're incrementing. The very next thing we want to do is swap or receipt that remote end and check for new errors. That clears it, then it was the remote side. 
If that doesn't clear it, then let's swap or reseat the local end. Check again, and then we know whether or not it was the local side. If none of those two things work, then we need to look at the fiber connection and any kind of fiber infrastructure in between. So for stack ports, things are going to be a little bit different. Obviously, it's a specialized cable, so we have some kind of different um, uh, commands you'll have to run to test those. Uh, in the first, you can see um, you may see syslog messages happening when a stack cable flaps. Um, however, a stack cable may not flap for every type of error, but when it does, you know there's a problem. If you see these up-down messages and eventually maybe a switch get kicked out of the stack, you know that there's a stack cable type issue. If the stack cable is not flapping and you don't see any syslog messages, but you've isolated it down to some problem between two switches in a stack, we have some more deeper kind of registers that we can read that are basically like a regular port. You know, there's CRC type errors, right? They're input type errors. There's something problematic with the packets being transmitted. So here we get a little bit deeper into it. We run the command for one of those registers, and you can see there's like these six lanes within the stack cable. Uh, these counters are in hexadecimal, but the main most important thing is just that you notice they're incrementing. If you see it at C9, it then goes up in values, and you can see that there's an active problem. Troubleshooting will be very similar. Uh, we need to confirm that they're actively incrementing. Then, if there's a stack adapter, we may swap that on one end. Check again. If that doesn't fix it, we swap it on the other end. Check again. Or if there's no stack adapter and it's a stack cable, we may swap that, or the last two bullet points that are mentioned at the bottom are really key here. We want to make sure that this cable is right side up. You can see in the picture, there's an image of the Cisco logo, and it's important that that logo is right side up, readable right side up. The other part is proper tightening. We see a lot of problems where it's just too loose or too tight. Uh, stack cables should be as tight as you can get them with your fingers. You should never tighten them by a tool. However, they should be as tight as you can get with, you know, finger tight, essentially. So that concludes everything on ports, stack ports. Um, we're going to do another polling question here. Uh, just to ask generally, how familiar were these troubleshooting techniques? Were you, did you know them? Did you not know them? You might be able to see the results later. Uh, yes, I do, actually. So, yeah, we're kind of split, it looks like, right? We've got 33% of you said yes, right? A lot of the troubleshooting methodologies that we've discussed are, are familiar. And then it looks like we've got 26% that said no. Uh, so that's awesome, right? We're able to hit kind of that sweet spot and, and start to educate you guys as well. And then we've got about roughly 40% that didn't answer. So no issue there. Uh, thanks for joining. So we'll go ahead and continue with the rest of the slide deck. So I'll go ahead and start talking about PoE diagnostics, right? And so with PoE, there are several different ways to try and detect your issue, whether it's specific to the hardware component, the interface, um, or, or the board itself. And so part of PoE diagnostics includes running very specific goal tests against that. So for Catalyst 9200, 9300, and 9400, we have several tests to help validate the functionality of the actual PoE controller. Now, just a fair warning, the Catalyst 92 and 9300 tests are disruptive, so please consider running these tests during a non-business hour or during a maintenance window, as these tests will require the switch to get reloaded, right? And so on the next slide, what we'll talk about is actually how the tests look like from a CLI perspective. So on a Catalyst 9300, you can run and start the command via diagnostic start switch, the switch number, the test, and then as this example, we're executing the diag PoE test. From there, uh, just as Ambrose has kind of discussed as well, if these tests are disruptive, the switch will prompt you for permission to actually execute it. Once the, once the test actually is finished, then you can view the results in line, either through the output of show log or with this command specifically. Show diagnostic result, switch, the switch number, and then the test that you just executed, right? So in this example, test eight is tied to the PoE diagnostic test, and we've passed it uh, that's indicative of the dot. Next thing we want to consider in relation to PoE, and when troubleshooting PoE issues are confirming whether or not the device actually has enough power to power that device. 
So there's several different ways to pull and massage that data from the switch. One of the first commands is going to be show platform software inline power system and then the switch number. Or if you have a line card, you specify that specific line card in a modular chassis. And in that output, we actually list our, our wattage in milliwatts, right? So we have close to 857 watts available. We've probably used 8.8 .8 watts for that specific phone. And then we can see that post or power on self-test has been completed and that we have succeeded. The other way to validate some of the power if through a different command is show power inline module and then the module itself. From this output, we can see that we have close to 848 watts available. We've already used 8.9. And this output is actually able to demonstrate where the power is being drawn per port, what class that device is, what our max allocation is as well, and if the device is CDP or LLDP capable, view the device in line there. Another thing to keep in mind of is the operational status, right? So if you were to see the op operational status bad or faulty, that may indicate a hardware failure, but isn't necessarily 100% accurate. There are definitely certain caveats or ways that the switch will report that, but it not actually be a hardware failure. Next, we'll go ahead and talk about PoE log messages. Some of these are, these are some of the most common syslog messages that TAC sees. First one being inline power, power deny, right? So pretty self-explanatory, but what this error message means is that there's not enough power remaining on the switch to supply PoE to ports or just a single port, right? Uh, this may be due to several different scenarios. One of the most common ones is actually utilizing stacked switches, Catalyst 9300, Catalyst 9200, and with stack power, you have your redundancy mode set to redundant, right? What that will result is in the largest power supply being held in reserve in case a power supply fails. So what you can do is change that mode from redundant to combined, and that will allow all available power to be utilized to provide for PoE. Now, in this output as well, you'll also see there's several different ways to validate it, whether it's from the output of show log, you'll actually get prompts from the switch that says why we've denied power to that specific device. The next most common PoE syslog message that we encounter is related to post, right? So in this example, right, the switch has executed its power on self-test and actually failed and is purposely disabling or not allowing itself to provide power to, to ports on the device. So there's several different ways to validate it as well. You can use the output from show post or in show log to confirm this, right? And again, this is just a non-exhaustive list. There's definitely other messages that we can encounter in the field. And Ambrose and I definitely suggest consulting a TAC BU authored PoE troubleshooting guide for a more detailed list, as well as definitions and actions for any related PoE issues that you might encounter in the field. Now, in relation to that, we can also talk about ways to isolate PoE issues, right? If you don't see any of your syslogs, all power is good, the system is passing post, what else can you think about to try and triage and understand whether or not you're experiencing hardware failure? So one of the most important questions to ask is, does that device work before? As in, did it just fail out of the blue or was this a new deployment? A lot of that information is actually very helpful and beneficial and help triaging where exactly the fault is. Another and more important question to help understand is, does this device actually impact or does the issue impact one class of device or multiple classes of devices, right? So with IP phones, access points, even cameras, they all need varying requirements for PoE and therefore power, right? So if your issue only impacts class four devices, uh, but, it, but your class three devices work, then from there, that gives you some additional information to understand where your actual issue is and where you need to focus your troubleshooting on. Next, we'll go ahead and talk about what exactly is non-hardware failure and how do we actually define that. So from our perspective, we define non-hardware failure as any time a device is not behaving as expected, but somehow recovers on its own 
or there's a change in configuration, traffic profile, or let's say you were to also reboot or upgrade the switch, and that actually resolved the issue as well, then we consider all of these as non-hardware failures. And so as we progress, we're going to talk about several different examples of non-hardware failure. First one being boot up, second being PoE, and then third, software defects that make it look like you're actually experiencing hardware failure, but you're not. Some of the signs of non-hardware failure are actually relatively easy to identify. Those include your post diagnostics, your LEDs, they're all passing, they're all green. If you were to attempt to troubleshoot and the failure is fixed by moving it to say another switch, another chassis, or another port within the device, that's also another indication that we don't have hardware failure. Um, especially if the, the symptom is transient or somehow recovers on its own as well, that's just further indication that we don't really have hardware failure. And it's important to note, if there's a device or a feature that isn't that is failing above layer two or higher, and we have all of our other diagnostics and all other methods to try and understand that the issue is not there, and they all pass, then we need further troubleshooting, right? Anything above L1 is going to be more susceptible to software defects, configuration issues, and even traffic can impact the switch and result in behavior that that simulates legitimate hardware failure. So we'll talk about the first one, right? This is an issue that we see quite commonly within Cisco Attack. The first one being the switch booting up with zero configuration, right? You know you've saved your config multiple times. You even do a soft reload, a hard reload. You even upgrade the switch. And every single time the switch boots back up and it's back to default configuration, right? And since this issue is such low level, there isn't too much to validate, it can appear as if you actually are encountering hardware failure. But in reality, the cause is the switch has actually been configured to ignore the startup configuration, resulting in this behavior. Now, there's several different ways to validate whether or not you're encountering this issue, whether or not you're from iOS, or you're actually sitting in Raman or switch prompt, there's several different ways to validate it, right? So you can use the command show ROMVAR or set to help validate that specific variable that we've highlighted, right? So if switch ignore startup configuration is set to one, 100% your switch is ignoring your startup configuration and you will boot up with zero configuration. So how do we actually resolve that and then remediate that behavior? Well, if you're from iOS or if you're in Raman, you can actually set the variable back to zero or purposely configure it that with the command no system ignore startup config switch all, and that will also set the variable back to zero and therefore remediating that specific issue. Next, we'll go ahead and shift into PoE and IMAX, uh, specifically IMAX and T-Start errors. So the issue here, right, is powered devices such as IP phones, cameras, access points, they fail to receive PoE from our switches. Now, these devices may have worked on older switches, but in reality, that occurs because there are less stringent power compliance with the older switches. Uh, a good example, right, is here is if a customer replaces a Catalyst 3750 with a 3850 or a 9300, uh, we, we've definitely seen TAC cases get opened up where the device used to work, but as soon as it shifts over to a new platform, it doesn't work anymore. And what our Cisco hardware teams have been able to demonstrate via testing in the lab is that these devices actually aren't compliant with the IEEE spec. And our new switches, the 3850, the 9300, are actually enforcing and following the standard more closely. From a perspective of what actually causes an IMAX or a T-Start error, an IMAX error occurs when that PoE-capable device actually draws more power than it has negotiated with the switch. The T-Start error is very similar. The, it just happens during initial negotiation, not afterwards. Now, if you're troubleshooting PoE and trying to figure out Am I hitting or encountering an IMAX or a T-Start error? There are several different ways. The first one is going to be validating from the output of show log, right? Within that message, you can see we, we've specifically denied power to that device, and we're reporting an IMAX error has been detected, or we've encountered a T-Start error, and we're not going to power that device. 
Now, in terms of remediation steps, there's two. First one being, let's try and mitigate basically the amount of power that's needed to actually get sent to the device by using a longer ethernet cable. Or if all else fails, we can definitely use a power injector. That way the device is able to still receive network connectivity through the switch, but is no longer dependent on PoE. And then finally, if that's none of those options work, we need to contact the appropriate vendor of the powered device, as it, it more than likely is not IEEE compliant. Next, we'll talk about software defects and how they can actually result in symptoms and behavior that makes it look like hardware failure. So this defect right here, the one ending in 238, is a Mac learning defect that impacts Catalyst 9200 switches uh, after they've been up for around 49 days. So you can definitely see some odd behavior. You'll see your interface counters just not increment or stop working. Any MAC addresses that need to get learned don't get learned, and then devices that should be aged out aren't getting aged out of the MAC address table. You'll also see packet loss to very specific hosts and unknown unicast flooding. Now, let's say you were to actually take an action and, and resolve the issue by yourself via a reload. You actually re fix the issue, but only temporarily, as in another 49 days, you'll encounter the same issue. Now from here, we definitely can see a lot of the symptoms and the issues, they present themselves like hardware failure, but in reality, it's not, right? A lot of the issues and the symptoms experienced are above layer one, and further troubleshooting would be required to help triage this issue. And so with that, we'll actually shift into our third polling question. So what are other platforms or deeper dives into a specific technology you as the audience would like to see in f in future troubleshooting sessions? All right, so you should be able to see the results such as the audience. Mm -hmm. Excellent, all right. So we're seeing a, a healthy vote for security as well as wireless and data center and collaboration is following right behind. So that's good, okay gives us ideas of kind of what else to focus on for, for other troubleshooting sessions. Excellent, thank you. Sure. All right, so as we were talking about troubleshooting, we also want to discuss and provide a troubleshooting checklist, right? This checklist is most common and it's quick. It's a quick checklist for our most common issues, whether that be boot up issues, line card problems, PoE, as we've discussed, or even the device failing to be responsive or it unexpectedly reloading or crashing, as well as link up, right? So these are just some of our quick and dirty checklists that we've thought of and come up with as we've troubleshot different issues across across our time. Uh, one of the most specific ones, whether it's a line card problem, right? The first question we wanna understand is, is the device on the correct version of code to support the line card, right? As Cisco comes out with new hardware, we're going to introduce that hardware with new software. You need to ensure that you're on the correct version of code to support that line card. The same goes for troubleshooting device responsiveness issues, right? If that device is reloading or just stops responding to ping and you have to power cycle the device, it's interesting and good to understand whether or not we still have console access when that device is unreachable or were there any logs that got printed to your syslog buffer or to the switch itself right before you lost access or crashed, and then if there's any files that got generated. And let's say you actually went through all of these checklists, right? You validated all of the, the things we put here, and you still couldn't identify the issue. Well, then now, now is the time to think about your issue holistically and start to isolate it from a perspective of what else could be indicative of my problem, right? And some of my most favorite ones are actually validating configuration guides, white papers, Cisco validated designs and release notes. As a lot of the times, you just may be on the correct, the incorrect version of code to execute what you're trying to do or the feature that you're doing isn't supported until a later version of code. Another one that's very important is to understand variables that are unique to your specific network, right? Whether that's traffic patterns that are only specific to that site, if there's ESD, if your devices are properly grounded from an electrical standpoint, all of this is gonna make a difference because the switch isn't gonna be able to report, hey, 
I'm not properly grounded, I'm seeing ESD, and that's resulting in my PoE problems. But if you've recently moved buildings or you're about to move your devices into a building and then start to see issues afterwards, it's it's definitely helpful to understand what exactly changed, what could be impacting the switch and present the symptoms such as PoE problems. Finally, we'll go ahead and present this slide. This is just our resources that we use to kind of build this slide deck, as well as uh, some of our TAC BU authored content, right? Whether you're trying to troubleshoot how to get the switch out of Ramon or actually upgrade your Cat 9K, um, these are definitely resources that have gone through TAC and BU verification and validation, right? And again, this is a non-exhaustive list. We urge you guys to validate system management guides or hardware installation guides as well for your specific switch as you guys encounter and deploy your devices and potentially need to troubleshoot them. So with that, we'll go ahead and actually transition to any Q&A that you guys may have. Thank you very much, Nate and, and Ambrose and Ryan for this great session. Uh, let me have a look for those questions that we actually have. And I also would like to thank the audience for being with us today. Without you, this wouldn't be possible at all. So let me have a look. Well, we don't have questions, actually. It seems like Ryan has been actually clarifying most of them, but I don't know if Ambrose or Nate and you would like to actually Sure. Yeah. Something. I mean, it, it, was there anything at all that we covered? I know we went through the material really fast. Right. Is there any particular section of which you would like some additional clarification on or that we could go into further detail about um, or any other kind of hardware question maybe we, we didn't cover here that we could speak briefly about? Um, we're open to, to anything at this point. Actually, I got one question. It says, like, can we apply the same tool for other platforms or switches, like the ones that you presented? So these tools in this toolkit are, are um, fairly switching specific. Each each device is going to have um, its available diagnostic tools, right? So the one thing about platforms, I would say, is that there there are strong variations. Right now, we're looking at things that aren't just platform independent, right? They're dependent on the exact component, what type of processor might be in there. Um, so your your commands may vary some. Um, I would highly encourage you to look at the diagnostics guides for your particular platform, especially if, you know, maybe you would get some traction out of this on a router or something, but for, say, a, a firewall, something of that nature, we're, we, we wouldn't be able to speak as well to what toolkit they would have in there. All right, then we get another question. So I just assigned it to you, Amber, so I don't know if you want to read it out or have a look or need and or Ryan, any of you? Yeah, so this is the one about CRC errors, correct? Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, the, the, the troubleshooting with CRC errors, right? You're, you're absolutely right. There's very, there aren't really any necessarily, like there are some, you can look at LED status indicator, right, which tells you, hey, there's an error coming. So just from a visual perspective, we do have that um, blinking to amber and then green that tells us something is happening. Um, but they are a lot of, the troubleshooting is a lot of swap and check. Right, the, the way that our methodology is usually to take the device you're in control of, assuming it's one, and clear that side of it, right? Um, you know, just reseat that optic, check again, so on and so forth. But it's just kind of a matter of incrementally ruling out each section, right? If I took an optic and I reseated it, or maybe I take a known good optic, if I don't trust that one and I plug it in, and I still have errors, then okay, let's move you know, up the chain. Let's go to the remote side, make sure his SFP is clean and so on. And then finally, it may come down to, you know, the fiber and patch panel, which we usually leave for the last just because that can be more complicated. There can be patch panels in between. You may have to get some sort of a fiber tester involved or, or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. I'll also add, I think it's the majority of our devices are store and forward, as in, if we're receiving CRCs and the other side is a catalyst, it's a router, some sort of UCS chassis like that, these devices should be store and forward. So what that means, right, is if we detect a CRC, I'm not going to forward that packet. I, I need to actively drop it. But the only exception here is actually Nexus. 
they are cut through switching. So by the time they actually compute the FCS, that packet is already left. And so if you're troubleshooting in a mixed environment where you've got Nexus connected to Catalyst, um, it actually may not be the Nexus that's causing your CRCs. You need to look upstream further. All right, thank you. So Nate and uh, Ryan, actually, we haven't heard from you. <laughs> and we got a comment and question about speed negotiation. Uh, I don't know if you would like to cover that one or comment something about that. Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll add a comment here on that. That's, that's a great question about speed negotiation, and it's something that how do we negotiate that, right? There's a series of register bits within our PHY, right? So the one end sends a, a, a series of flags, right? I, I negotiate at this speed. I can negotiate at this duplex. And, and so we run into problems where these PHYs become very vendor-specific. Some may have three registers while well, our only have two. The, the diagnostic for that is we essentially have, you can dump these five bit registers, right? And you can, you can see, hey, what did the remote side actually try to negotiate with me? And does it, does it match, right? Is it what I need to see on my side to be able to negotiate that same speed and duplex? Um, so for that, really what we do is just rely on the IEEE standard to tell us what bits need to be negotiated here. Um, and there's a series of CLIs for that, but again, it's a little, um, uh, you know, we, we kind of have to look at it from both a vendor perspective and then look at what each side is negotiating to understand if we're, if we're getting the right values to be able to, say, get to a full 100 connection. Thank you very much. So I think with that one, we will close on, oh, hold on, I think there's one more one coming. Oh, no, it's just a thank you for <laughs> clarifying that question. Uh, all right, so I think with that one, we will close down like the live Q&A session. So once again, remember, if you have an extra question or something comes to your mind, uh, we did not have the chance to cover your question, which I think we cover all of them. Remember that we will have this forum, Ask Me Anything, connected to this session. Uh, all right, so it's going to be available to May 21st. Uh, the details to access to this session are going to be allocated in the chat panel. And also, we invite you to have a look to our social media channels and there you can find information about sessions like this one and other related sessions such as the community lives that we organize we are available on twitter facebook on linkedin uh, on youtube and also for those of you who are customers and partners you can find all the information in the application just at the cisco technical support area and well uh, just uh, if, if you'd like to find uh, more events, training, and sessions, uh, have a look to everything that Cisco Learning is offering. That you will be able to enhance your knowledge and learn more about different topics. And well, finally, thank you so much for your time, for joining us today and for making this possible. And we would like to ask if you can please participate in one survey that is coming out just once you close down the session. Uh, this survey helps us out to identify how we are doing uh, what kind of things you would like to see in, in our coming events, the topics, uh, things we'd like to cover, and what did you like and what we can improve. So please don't forget to fill out that survey. It's going to take you a couple of seconds. And that's it for today. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Ambrose, Nidan, Ryan, uh, Jimena, on all the team who has made this possible. And well, that's it for today. So with that, we conclude the session. Thank you, everybody, and see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks.